We want a self-sustaining fire that radiates so much heat you can barely stand next to it. While we're at it, we want it to burn at least 10 to 12 hours without us laying a finger on it. Too much to ask? Well, we don't think so. We'll start by gathering the wettest wood we can possibly find, and we're gonna make sure that every piece is picked up right off the ground. Wait, what? What's with these Wilderness Strong guys anyway? Everybody knows that dry wood generates more heat and Fire Making 101 clearly teaches you to not pick up wood from the forest floor, especially when it's been lying there all winter like this stuff. Well, sometimes we like to think of rules as more guidelines after all. You see, we're using this seemingly horrible firewood for a couple reasons. First, using wet wood for this video will clearly demonstrate how effective this fire lay can be because when you see how easy it is to burn this giant pile of wet wood without a knife or any splitting, it should go without saying what would happen if your wood was dry. Also, we just like to push the limits to see what can be done in survival situations and find that fine line that divides possible and impossible. There's a lot of education that happens in the pursuit of finding that line. So we used nearly all saturated wood off the forest floor for the fires you're gonna see and intentionally did not use a knife to improve the wood at all. And the results might surprise you. Now we do need to break up this mess of wet firewood into the sizes that we need. Methods for breaking up firewood seems like a subject that doesn't get covered a lot, but it's important. Especially if you have a particular fire lay in mind that calls for specific sizes like this one. So we decided to quickly show you several methods for breaking wood in situations where you might not have a saw, an ax, or a big knife. Okay, now that we have the quantity we need for a big hot fire, we want to organize it from biggest to smallest. Now with a traditional bottom-up fire lay, we would start with some fine tinder and then small kindling and keep adding bigger wood as we go. But my question to you is this, with no knife and only a small armful of dry kindling, how would you go about making a big hot fire with all of this soaking wet wood? Well, it's not impossible, but it's gonna take some serious effort and maintenance to keep this thing going for hours and hours. But again, our goal here is to make a hot fire that is self-sustaining. We don't wanna add, rotate, or move any wood at all. We wanna light it and forget about it. We're talking total hands-off for 10 to 12 hours. So we're gonna flip things upside down and start with the biggest, wettest wood at the bottom working our way up to the top where we'll lay our smaller pieces. Once we do that, we'll simply take all the dry kindling that we could come up with and make a fire like normal on top of this wet mess. We're gonna build decks or platforms that stack on top of each other and we'll alternate the direction of the wood with each new deck to support airflow and make the structure more stable. Our lower decks are gonna have the biggest wood, but it's okay if you wanna add in some smaller pieces as you go to help keep your decks level. You want this structure to be as balanced and level as possible to avoid having the whole thing tip over while your fire is burning. Definitely learned that one the hard way. You could call this an upside down fire, which is a pretty accurate way to describe it, but I prefer upside down self-sustaining fire because really that's the biggest draw to this fire lay. Having a fire that's radiating constant heat in all directions, burning all night and requiring no maintenance once it's made even utilizing wet wood. Now, as we get near the top of our stack, we're gonna start tapering down to the smaller sizes, but we still are not concerned about the moisture in the wood. That's all gonna be taken care of after we light this thing on fire. And we'll give you a close-up view of what happens to all that moisture. Now, you can make this stack whatever height you choose, but it's crucial that your top couple decks are made up of medium-sized wood that preferably is not saturated with moisture. A bit damp is okay, but these very top decks need to bridge the gap between your smaller dry firewood kindling on top and the bigger firewood that makes up your middle and lower decks. If you try to make the jump between small dry kindling and big wet wood, you'll just end up with a result like this. Not enough medium sized wood to bridge the gap between the kindling on top and the bigger wood in the middle. This fire that you make on top has to be made out of mostly good dry kindling. There's really no way around that. You don't need a ton of it, and you can mix in a little damp wood if it's small, but don't push your luck on this. That fire on top has to burn hot to create hot momentum to get the ball rolling. 
We simply use the dead under branches from a nearby cedar tree. <laughs> okay, let's light this thing up. And if you're new to our channel, you will quickly learn how passionate we are about the concept of finding natural plant tinder that can be harvested and processed in the wild for flint and steel fire making and used uncharred. We have one video in particular that covers all of our findings and nearly all of the tinders covered in that video are from plants that we had never seen or heard discussed ever for flint and steel fire making. Okay, back to our upside down self-sustaining fire. Check out how amazing this nettle slash mugwort tinder blend is at catching a spark from a flint and steel. Did I mention this tinder is uncharred? It doesn't take long before the hot fire on top dries out the first couple of smaller wet layers below it. We enjoyed this particular fire for several hours maintenance free before we had to beat the dark and hike out of the canyon. So we didn't get to film the entire process, but let's jump over to a different fire we made so we can show you the full process that happens inside this fire and how long it burned. Again, soaking wet wood right off the forest floor. In fact, this fire was made in the early spring only a few minutes after a heavy rain and windstorm came through that dumped rain on me for about 20 minutes as I was hunkered under a cedar tree gathering materials. It was great. This fire burned over 12 hours, which would have made this video run a bit long. So we didn't film all of it, but it should be self-evident from what you see here how long and hot these fires can burn. What you really want to watch for here is what's happening underneath that top fire. You want to see a process happening where the wood from each deck breaks down into coals that dry and burn the subsequent decks below it, and so on and so on, all the way down to the very bottom deck. And you may be wondering about all that moisture in the wood. What happens to it? Why doesn't it put the fire out? Well, if you put wet wood right on top of a medium hot fire, the flame and the overall heat are going to be suppressed by the wet barrier that they run into. But with an upside down method, there's nothing above the flame to hold back the heat while the wet wood below the fire dries out, pushing the moisture to the ends of the wood. As the wood dries out, the hot coals keep dropping down, burning through each deck. You don't get a lot of big hot flames with this kind of fire. It more so just dissolves into a giant heap of hot coal that radiates a nice even heat all around. Now I had seen upside down fires made before, but I had never seen one made from wood this wet. And that really was the most exciting thing to me. The ability to make a pile of seemingly horrible firewood that generates intense heat just by making a hot enough fire on top of it. And again, hands off, no adding wood and no maintenance at all. And here's what this particular fire looked like the next morning. I'd say that's pretty efficient. Okay, we'll go ahead and allow ourselves to finally do a little maintenance and this thing is ready to go again. You can make these in smaller sizes, but if you do choose to make the big ones like we did, you'll need to be aware that they could have a tendency to tip or lean if you aren't on level ground. You may have noticed that we drove a few stakes in on one of these fires because we wanted to make sure our logs didn't start rolling since the ground wasn't exactly level. It all worked out in the end, I'd say. Now, not all fire making situations are the same, and this upside down self sustaining method we just showed you is not something we'd use in every situation. In a normal relaxed fire setting, this would be a bit overkill, and it involves more prep work ahead of time. And even though it's fun to build these things, it takes a bit of time to lay it all out after you've split your wood to size. Also, maybe you don't want your fire to be self-sustaining. You might be kind of like me and feel like that takes away a bit of your fun and entertainment for the evening, and that is totally understood. I mean, I had a now, terrible time have... disciplining myself to keep my hands off of this fire. But the pros hopefully speak for themselves. Hot fire, long fire, zero maintenance, even radiating heat, and it can be made with mostly wet wood and no knife needed. Now for the record, we used mostly dug fir and maple for these fires. Fir and maple make pretty quality firewood, so we can't speak to how successful this would have been with less quality firewood, but we plan on doing some more experimenting as usual. Now we're a bit crazy about fire making in general, and if you want to see what else we've done with friction fires, wet weather fires, and making flint and steel fires from plant tinder without any charring, check out our fire making playlist. Thanks for watching.